What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. Action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Hello everyone. Thank you for coming uh, and viewing us here for this important session on building sustainable food value chains in Asia. And as we all know, food is a very vital issue for us, but the way we've been managing it all this while has been very imbalanced. We actually produce enough food for everyone, but even today, one in 10 people don't have enough and more than 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet. At the same time, we end up wasting nearly a third of all that we produce. Current food systems need a change. Uh, they've become unsustainable from an economic, social, environmental point of view, and they're also very vulnerable to extreme uh, weather events. What we also know is they are also responsible for nearly a third of the global greenhouse gas emissions. What the world needs is a more resilient and a robust food system so that we can ensure food security for many more people. I just found a report by the World Bank which said that nearly 272 million people are facing food insecurity. That's a very high number that we ought to be thinking about. So joining me today is a very uh, esteemed panel. Um, let me just share with you quickly and I'll tell you more about them shortly. I have with me Dr. Naoko Ishii, Secretary General uh, Jokhoi Lim. I have three business leaders, Mr. Vergis, Park uh, uh, Anko Sobroto, I hope I have said your name right. And we have Ms. Carrie Chan from Hong Kong. Let me tell you a little bit about each one of them. Um, so Dr. Naoko Ishii is Professor and Director of the Center for Global Commons at the University of Tokyo. She has been Deputy Vice Minister, uh, Vice Finance Minister of Japan, and she worked with the World Bank, International Monetary Fund and the Harvard Institute for International Development. Uh, Dato Lim 
um, was Brunei's permanent secretary at the Ministry of Fo uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade. And he's been involved in discussions for the ASEAN economic community, as well as several free trade area discussions. I have with me Mr. Sani Burgess. He is co-founder and group chief executive officer of Olam International, a leading food and agribusiness headquartered in my home country, Singapore. And Olam today operates in over 60 countries, delivering various agricultural raw materials and food ingredients to over 25,000 customers. And Mr. Burgess is also the chairman of the Human Capital Leadership Institute you here. Also on our panel is Ms. Carrie Chan, Chief Executive Officer with Avant Meats from Hong Kong. They're doing some amazing work in the area of research. And besides being a seasoned leader, she is a passionate environmentalist herself and has, has a keen interest in the diet of our planet. Personally, I'm also keen to know more about the work she's doing, especially in the area of coming out with fish uh, related products. And we have uh, Park Pusodo uh, Anko Subroto from Indonesia. Um, he's the chairman of Gunung Sebu Kanchana. It's an investment uh, with a focus on agribusiness, uh, agri businesses, property development, and financial services. Thank you everyone for making time for today's discussion. Just a note for our audience, um, if you wanna leave any questions, please leave it in the chat box and it will be relayed to me. And I'll try and make time to take as many questions as possible with our esteemed panelists. Dr. Ishi, allow me to begin with you. Um, food system emissions represent nearly a third of all GHG emissions. And they're also a major factor for the loss of biodiversity and have a severe impact on the Earth's environment. How do you assess where does the region system stand in the global environmental crisis? And also, uh, what is the pathway to bring about a change so that we can work towards a better future for all of us? Thank you, Shifali, for the great question. Yes, that uh, you clearly stated that we were in global environmental crisis. And as you already said, the food is a major threat, major reason why we are in this environmental crisis. Um, but at the same time, if we were able to transform this food system, this provides a fundamental solution to the uh, global environmental challenge, as well as actually another challenge of increasing social division or uh, social vulnerability. So the food system can do a lot. Going back to your question about what is especially the, uh, the Asia place that, uh, uh, in it. The Asia, as all of us you, uh, already know, is a home to 50% of the global population and, and actually are increasing and also with the burdening middle class. So by 2030, 3.5 billion middle class we will have. So with the source of the growth and the uh, technology and the innovation, we have a huge stake to, to actually dictate which direction we will be going to. Actually, that we will actually that unfortunately accelerate this downward spiral uh, to the hot house us, uh, the tragedy, or we can save ourselves and save the world. So that the Asia's role is extremely important in transforming uh, the food system. Another important thing about the Asia is that the Asia embraces that one of the richest uh, natural capital resources. You look at the uh, forest, the rain, rainforest, that the land and the wetland, uh, that the uh, water, the oceans, and the key ecosystems. So what we can do with those and the ecosystem and the natural capital also play a very significant role so that we Asia as a producer and also the consumer of food, but also a guardian of the, the very important natural um, uh, ecosystems, which provide a lot of service to our sustainable uh, development. So to me, the fundamental solution uh, to transform the food system is how to put the price uh, on the natural capital um, on which the food system so heavily uh, relies, um, relies. That the, now, right now the problem is that the natural capital is treated as more like a free good, so that we use and we, uh, we waste it as much as we want as a free good. But that 
that, but we are facing the consequences of this and the free good and the, the perception. So if you are able to recognize that the value, the natural capital uh, along the food chain that from production to, to uh, that distribution to consumption, even to the waste, we should be able to transform the food system uh, the entirely. So uh, the, the good news is that the world is actually that they're not seeing a lot of Initiative, the mostly uh, uh, triggered, actually sponsored by the business circle, how to value, how to measure uh, the, those natural capital, and how to consistently report. So if we are able to make it happen through the entire value chain of the food, we will see that a uh, completely different uh, food system in the future. But it cannot be done without leadership, leadership of Asia. And then not only the political leadership, but the business leadership, the leadership of the consumer and the producer, and we the citizens. So we do have a lot of hope and a lot of responsibility as Asian uh, to uh, transform the food system and to save us and to save the world. Back to you, Sylvie. Sure. I think you brought up some very important points. Uh, we have to take a holistic approach. Uh, yes, we should focus on the entire ecosystem. That's the best way to be addressing the issue. And um, the stakeholders, the leadership that is vital, it, it is uh, just so pertinent. Um, I suppose we should be deep diving, but let me first draw in the views of everyone. Uh, Dr. Lim, if I can go to you, um, you know, I Agriculture, as we all know, is such a significant contributor to the GDP of this region. And while it is a major industry and, em and it employs so many people, it still puts a burden on the environment. So uh, what are your thoughts? What are your suggestions? And how can the region build a sustainable and resilient food system while still keeping it a very pivotal uh, industry of this region? Uh, also, if you can share some ASEAN policy um, suggestions in this regard or the work that is going on, it will be great. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. <coughs> ASEAN is projected to grow around average 0.77% per annum from 2020 to 2035. I think this is uh, um, Therefore, ensuring a sustainable and resilient food system will be very important for the region. Having said that, I think we recognize that food production increase can also have a multiple impact on environment, such as uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission, water mm -hmm. resources, uh, biodiversity, and etc. I think ASEAN therefore needs a strategy to, to meet the needs of the growing population while ensuring that uh, this is in line with the regional's uh, goal of sustainable development. And also at the same time, increase production and provide employment to the rural and to the urban area. Various initiatives are currently in place in ASEAN uh, to promote sustainable and resilient food system in the region. Uh, this include we have a vision and strategy plan for ASEAN Cooperation Food in Agriculture Forestry uh, 2016 and 2025. The ASEAN Regional Guideline for Promotion of Smart Agriculture Practices. And third is the multi-sectoral framework on the climate change and agriculture forestry towards the food and nutrition security and achieving a sustainable development goal and, and also we, the ASEAN's declaration of the strengthening of the uh, adapt adaptation of the drought. But given the importance of the issue, uh, we are working on three additional important initiatives to further boost uh, the region's food security, food safety, and food sustainability. First, uh, the development of ASEAN guideline on sustainable agriculture. This is one of the key initiatives under the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework, which is the region uh, exit strategy to the COVID-19 pandemic. Second is the study on the use of agriculture, uh, agrochemical agriculture production to further ensure that safety, 
to our consumer and protect the, and the health of the farmers and the environment. And finally, I think we have also currently promoting nature-based solution to address important global challenges such as climate change, degradation of land and marine ecosystem. Uh, the initiative will help support the regions in identifying opportunity and how to integrate uh, and enhance the uptake of nature-based solution in our cooperation in food, agriculture, and forestry. We are also uh, working towards having uh, engage in the technology, especially digital technology for sustainable agriculture and further our people in the agriculture forestry area are looking at cold change management, how we can develop that uh, system in such a way it will help to increase productivity and to the market as well as to the uh, consumer. So that's the, the, the initiative that ASEAN is undertaking we realize that to keep this, the, the, the area sustainable, uh, we need to do a lot of uh, uh, technology uh, application. Thank you. Great. Um, you've shared very candid comments. And clearly, while a lot is going on, a lot more needs to be done, given what you uh, stated right at the beginning, that ASEAN is looking to grow by 77% in the coming years. So we're li living in a region that is going to see a lot of change. But uh, Mr. Varghese, let me uh, turn to you with the twin crisis that we are facing right now. We have the pandemic on one hand, and on the other hand, it's the climate change crisis. I'm still trying to figure out between the two, which one is going to be more impactful, but I think it will be climate change. And I want to ask you, um, you know, in the current circumstances, when we've seen movement restrictions in place, border controls, um, would you throw some light on the challenges you're facing to your business? And, you know, are there opportunities as well? Also, if I can add in, do you see yourself transforming the business model in the coming years that you've been following so far? Uh, thank you, Shafali. Uh, I think uh, the impact of the pandemic and COVID-19, uh, because of the nature of the crisis, is light in our face, very tangible, very discernible, and our uh, response times have to be in days, weeks, months, if you have to tackle the crisis and survive. Whereas climate change, on the other hand, is more distributed dangers, which are cumulative and gradual in nature. And therefore, getting people to act on climate change today for a slightly more forward or distant benefit is the real uh, existential question of our times. Uh, COVID, we have acted because we know that we might die if we don't act today. Whereas climate change is not as tangible and discernible, so it is a little bit more distant and into the future. So really trying to understand the challenges of COVID and climate change on food and agricultural production, with particular reference uh, to Asia, I think is useful for us to understand. Firstly and for, foremost, we've already seen significant food price inflation, as we're all experiencing when we do our grocery buying, that between January 2020 and July 2021, according to the World Bank, food price inflation is about 40%. And it hasn't stopped in July. In August, we have seen further increases in food price inflation with uh, corn prices uh, going up 16% and wheat prices going up 12% and so on and so forth. And this disproportionately affects the poor people uh, because their uh, consumption expenditure, the food consumption out of the total consumption expenditure is very high. And as a result of food price inflation, they're impacted. And because of COVID, their incomes in anyway declined. So according to the World Bank, about 99 million people have been added to the below $1.90 poverty line definition just between 20, 19, 2019 and 2020. So you've already got impaired incomes, loss of jobs, and then you've got high food price inflation. And for consumers who've got large percentage of the consumption basket spent on food, they are in a real crisis. And that is why the World Food Program has said that between 19 and 20, the number of people who are acutely hungry, which means level C stage of food insecurity, that means they cannot survive without external food assistance, has doubled from 2019, 135 million to 2020, 270 million. 
So that is the first direct uh, challenge. The uh, second challenge that we are seeing is because of COVID and all of the supply chain disruptions, where there's availability on, uh, for on-farm workers, mm -hmm. the cost of getting people to come out of the farms and with the social distancing and the other precautions that need to be maintained, cost of production is going up. In the logistics supply chain, there are many bottlenecks in terms of port congestion, the availability of workers and labor in the port, their productivity as a result of all of these uh, uh, security-based restrictive conditions that we have, have all uh, disrupted the supply chain. I think a good example of looking at what climate change, COVID coming together does for the supply chains in food and ag in Asia is to take the example of rice. There are 144 million farmer households that are engaged in rice production. 95% of them are in Asia. A significant part of that is also women. Unfortunately and tragically, 90% of the Asian rice farmers live at or below the poverty line, less than $1.90 a day. And if you look at the difference between the minimum poverty line uh, income of $1.90 per day versus the fair living income in those countries, the minimum poverty line definition is only a third of what is the fair living income those farmers need to access a decent quality of life. And yet, rice farming accounts for 16% of all the greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture, 10% of its methane emissions, a third of the paddy that is produced is lost on the farm and post-harvest, and three and a half billion people in the world, 20% of the world's calories comes from rice. Three and a half billion people in the world consume rice. We need to increase rice production by 15%. According to IPCC, rice production will decline by 15% by 2050. How are we going to square this off? Right? So these are coming together. Uh, we have spent a $27 trillion in fighting the COVID pandemic. Right? And we have realized that not being prepared to deal with the COVID pandemic has cost us 10 times more than what it would have been if we prevented and preempted. And there were enough warning signs that a pandemic is likely to hit us. Right. We're not uh, similarly doing anything about uh, climate change or not enough about climate change uh, because we will deal with the crisis when it happens at 100 times more cost than trying to do and deal with it today. Actually, uh, everything you've said is reason why all of us need to really work together and come out with uh, pertinent solutions. So I don't know even uh, if solution is valid, but there's clearly a lot for us to do to be able to address the core issue. But let me bring in Ms. Chan from uh, Avant Meets into the discussion. And I want to draw your attention to the technology factor. As we all know, uh, fourth industrial revolution is bringing about a big change in the way we work and operate. Um, could you uh, sort of um, share your thoughts on how technology can play a bigger role in being able to allow all of us to build more sustainable and resilient food systems? Yeah, definitely. So um, we work on a solution whereby we uh, explore a new way to produce uh, meat and animal protein. The reason being that we heard about, you know, the cha the challenges of uh, the the distribution of the food uh, for animal uh, meat. We actually using one third of the crop that is produced globally, using one third of the clean water is actually going to animal um, agriculture. Um, if we look at the conversion of the animal feed to the meat product. If we put in 100 unit of the calorie into the animal feed, we only get about 10 to 15 you know, unit of the calorie in terms of the meat product that we consume. So if we look at the efficiency rate about 10% to 15%, it means a lot of wastage. So if you ask, you, if we ask ourselves if our cars are actually you know, not efficient in using the fuel, actually 80% are actually not used in driving the car moving forward, we will wonder what is the problem there? What can we improve? So what we work on is actually try to remove the animal as the middleman between the natural resources like the crops and the meat product that we want. The technology coming from the bioprocess, which has been very well uh, practiced in the uh, medical and pharmaceutical field, uh, what is started is actually very similar to bioprocess of making yogurt. We They, they start with a cell culture, um, like a culture starter culture. In this case, we pick some cell from a living animal uh, biopsy 
we build a very healthy and continuous growing small population of the cells, and then we feed them the nutrient, no different from what we need to consume, like glucose, amino acid, vitamins, minerals, and giving them the right temperature, like pH level and 34 to 37 degrees Celsius in a uh, vessels, like making yogurt. And then in a much shorter time, we can get the animal protein and the meat that we want. Using this way we can reduce the uh, the use of the you know natural resources to produce a meat product also it also contribute to the what we do- talk about you know in terms of biodiversity in the case of fish for example we do not need to catch more fish so the fish can actually continue to regenerate and replenish themselves in the ocean uh, using this method we can also uh, address the problem of the long uh, supply chain for some of these meat products so we do not need to centralize the production in a farm and then you know fly them around to different parts of the market. We can actually produce locally for the local market, also reducing the carbon footprint. And uh, last but not least, the production cycle, you know, in, in this case, uh, depending on the meat type, uh, is only about one to two months time. So it versus, you know, few years for beef, uh, as well as, you know, about a, you know, nine months to 12 months for fish. It is actually a lot more shorter and, you know, speeding up the process in a way that we can have a more, you know, efficient way and all more, more sustainable supply of the meat protein for the population uh, concerned. Great. You know, the work you're doing is so fascinating and I really want to probe in terms of, you know, will consumers take to it? Uh, Would you want to give a quick reply? I do want to bring in Park Husodo into the conversation. Yes, very, uh, very quick. I think then we, uh, we, we received, you know, uh, you know, independent kind of survey, uh, different markets. Indeed, a lot of the uh, consumers nowadays realize that, you know, the challenge with the food supply chain and this, you know, security of the food, um, you know, meat supply as well. So, um, similar to other technology adaptation, we, we definitely see, you know, the earlier, uh, technology adapter like 20, 30%, up to 50% people, um, are very willing to up to to trying this kind of new product. It is actually more so in Asia. One of the research showed that uh, roughly about, you know, 50% of the people in China that responded to the survey actually very open up to this uh, new tech food as well. So we are definitely um, seeing uh, encouraging sign from that. That's really good to hear. Bakusa, though, um, you know, uh, we discussed the twin crisis uh, with Mr. Vergis, but I wanted to get your views on that very issue too. And if if you could share your thoughts on the business transformation that needs to happen, like, you know, what are the stages where we definitely need to bring about significant change? Is it production? Is it distribution? Um, your thoughts, please. Yes, th- th- thank you. Um, I think it's uh, mainly production and to some degree, is distribution the, the 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 production is that as a agricultural companies we want to increase yield uh, and reduce uh, using chemical actually uh, those two objective is not in conflict is actually incongruent uh, because the use of chemical uh, will uh, generate soil degradation and the productivity uh, once upon a time many years ago 10, ten over years ago we realized that uh, the soil quality is actually getting worse and worse because we just use uh, too much chemical so the idea is to reduce it uh, the reduction is actually improve uh, the mm-hmm. soil quality by uh, using more uh, uh, organic uh, material and that, therefore, the, the cycle that we use is that uh, we grow pineapples. We have about 33,000 hectares. Right. And the skin, the pineapple skin, is uh, used for feeding stock to the cattle. So uh, uh, we have about 20,000 head at any given time that would eat those pineapple skin. And, and then the cycle again, would, uh, uh, the, the manure will be put back to the field for composting and, uh, and the liquid manure would uh, go for biomass. We, we would be able to generate about one megawatt of capacity. Mm-hmm. So, so it's the concept of zero waste. 
uh, increasing productivity yield, reducing greenhouse gas emission, which we managed to reduce from 2013, is about 30% of our carbon footprint, and uh, using less chemical uh, and, and have a complete recycling. As far as the distribution, because Indonesia is such a, uh, also quite spread out, we work with farmers, with smallholders. Uh, we teach them how to grow bananas, Uh, in different markets so, so that, that we don't have to transport domestically so far distance. So it's a smaller farms for, 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 for particular markets. So that's what we are, we, 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 we are doing uh, for, 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 uh, at this moment. And, uh, and also uh, a part of the natural capital that uh, the professor was saying is, uh, is water. Uh, and what we do is we build uh, close to 300 lagoons, uh, We capture rainwater. In the past, we use deep well. Uh, we use deep well to 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 water the plant in the dry season. Now we actually has 70% percent sufficient to use uh, surface water from the rain capture, rain harvest. So those are the things that that initiative that we do. Uh, thank you. Yes, I mean, I'm so keen to know more. You're one of the world's largest producers of pineapple-based products. So, but uh, we're actually running a little bit behind schedule. And as I begin uh, my second round of questions, I'd like to just request you to just keep uh, it limited to uh, to be able to allow you to convey the key points. Dr. Lim, if I can turn to you, um, we all know that the region is a major producer and exporter of so many products, palm oil, crude, rubber, rice, sugar, and so much more. Um, what kind of policies do you think are really needed at various levels to allow us to strengthen the um, uh, food chain system that we have? Um. Yeah, we, we really believe in the importance of building a fair and resilient food change. And we undertake several initiatives that are aimed towards uh, achieving this objective. I think first, uh, we have invested a lot of efforts in further strengthening regional approaches to responsible and sustainable investment in food, agriculture and forestry. Uh, one example is the launching of the ASEAN guideline for promoting responsible investment in food, agriculture, forestry to ensure that the investment in agriculture uh, meet the global standards as well as promote a responsible and sustainable development. Uh, this guide, guideline is designed to attract greater inflow of foreign direct investment in the region and take into account Uh, varying situation responsibility, especially of smallholders, farmers, uh, MSME, large-scale agriculture enterprises. Second, uh, we also encourage our MSME to take a role in the food chain value change. This year alone, one of the key priority under the Brunei uh, chairmanship is to develop uh, ASEAN framework to support food, agriculture, forestry for small producer, uh, cooperative and micro, small and inter medium enterprises. This uh, framework intended to facilitate policy formulation and to manage uh, and promote small producer cooperative. At the same time, it will also improve ASEAN competitiveness and ensuring that the food product we produce meet international standard. Third, we are committed to address the issue of non-tariff measures, which is very important and critical in the food and agriculture product. As part of our efforts to address the impact of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we have adopted the supply chain connectivity uh, agreement under the Hanoi Plan of Action. The objective is to make sure the free flow of goods essential goods, transit, especially in the long term, and to further strengthen supply chain connectivity. Under this initiative, uh, MOU was signed last year. ASEAN member states agreed to eliminate the 
imposition of NTM for 152 essential uh, goods, mainly mostly on medical equipment and medical supplies. And this year we further expand the list to 107 items, which include uh, food, agriculture product. This is uh, essential to make sure this, there's a free flow of this product to ASEAN member states during the pandemic. In addition to this, we have also launched the NTM tools kit uh, to facilitate the reviewing of NTMs applicable to immediate inputs, which are critical in the value chain um, product. I think these are a few initiatives we think that, that will enhance our food and agriculture uh, industry in the region. Thank you. Absolutely. I have uh, so much more to ask you, but I hope all of the policy measures uh, and initiatives will have a big impact down the line. But we have a question from the member of the audience, and I'd like to draw the attention of our business uh, leaders here. Um, the uh, person is asking, what happens to the jobs of farmers and the rest in the food supply chain? They are definitely a very crucial component of the food supply chain. Would you like to uh, shed some light on that? I mean, things are changing. There is the technology dimension. There is the whole issue of tackling, um, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions. But what happens to the jobs of farmers and the rest in the food supply chain? So if you Anyone? look at the, if you look at the smallholder farmers. I, I believe there are two large, uh, two different uh, production systems uh, globally for food and ag. One is the smallholder farming systems, and then we have the large older mechanized large scale farming systems. Uh, the, uh, it's a false choice to say it is one or the other that will survive. In many countries, the mode of farming will be smallholder farming. So, what is important in order to have smallholder farming systems prosperous and not uh, and, and uh, transcend the current uh, poverty trap that they are in, with most of the smallholder farmers living below the poverty line, is to really improve smallholder farm productivity. So at OLAB, we have, for example, launched an initiative called Jiva, a farmer services platform, a smart smallholder farming system, which uh, through machine learning and AI, helps to provide uh, crop care nudges or agronomic advice to the farmer in terms of the next best action that he or she can take on a farm based on very contextualized and personalized advice, based on the topography of the farm, the soil conditions of the farm, the microclimate of the farm, in terms of what is the next best action that the farmer can take. We think it will dramatically catalyze smallholder farm production. In addition to providing them crop care advice, we also provide them inputs. We also provide offtake services for their output. Uh, we also provide credit scoring and microfinance support to the farmers. So I think we need initiatives that can actually catalyze farmer livelihoods. So that's one piece. Uh, the second thing that we have done is develop a sustainability insights platform for our customers. Because most of the uh, transformation of the whole value chain end to end to become more sustainable, to achieve system transformation, you need the power of the consumer and the customer. So with the customers, we are offering them now sustainability insights uh, through a digitally enabled dashboard on 10 key sustainability topics. We have more than 350 metrics that measures farmers' living income to the greenhouse gas intensity of our production to say whether the granular traceability that we have put in place allows us to source from farms to farmers where there is no child labor or forced labor practices, uh, that it is deforestation free supply, supply chains, or nature positive supply chains. So that is another initiative. And that initiative was a proprietary to OLAM. We have now decided to externalize it and commercialize it and make it open source. And we've now got a co-creation team of multi-stakeholders, about a dozen stakeholders from the production side, from the customer side, NGO civil society have now come together to create the sustainability platform as a reference industry platform across the sector. Great. Uh, Pakusoda, would you like to come and you deal with thousands of uh, people? Yes. Uh, so, so, so our our program is uh, working with uh, with 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 small uh, holders. Uh, is actually rather on experimentation 
uh, stage at this time. I mean, I cannot claim we are doing well in all sectors and the, the numbers is in the thousand, uh, not in the ten thousands. Uh, and it has been success, successful, particularly in two areas. In one is the cattle feedlot uh, and cattle breeding. And the other one is a small holders that we do uh, for growing bananas uh, with the small holders. Uh, we managed to uplift uh, the income of the farmers uh, probably two to three times from the minimum wage uh, so that farmers don't have to go uh, out of their farm and work in the city to become construction workers. So it's, it's not happening now because of COVID, but so they actually work quite well uh, uh, today. Uh, it, they are all going back to the, their farmlands. And, and also we uh, help uh, the, our facilities uh, to improve productivity yield. Uh, tapioca uh, farming farmers in, uh, in, in Lampung area, in East Lampung, uh, productivity is about eight to 10 uh, tons per hectare. And uh, we are experimenting today. We are teaching farmers how to, uh, and, and we, have, we have some result that they could grow up to 30 tons uh, per hectare. So it's, 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 it's uh, showing some early result and, 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 and we buy those uh, products back because uh, we guarantee if they don't harvest early, because if you harvest early, the, the starch content is very low and that's what they normally do. So if we talk to them, uh, you can, you, we can, uh, if you can keep it up to maturity, up to the optimum level, you will get a better price. So, so we are working also with the local governments. I, I think the, uh, we, we are trying to, we haven't been successful to work with local government is to create an externship for uh, the, uh, the, the local government to be trained by us so that they can go back uh, to, uh, to, so we, we, we participate in the government capacity building so that the government, the local government could help uh, the region to build their capacity. So, so that's that's on the uh, on, on the experiment stage now that we are we, we, we are doing. No, 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 no. I, we can't hear you. Might yeah, ah. the mic seems to be not working on Shafali Zayo. It, okay, uh, uh, okay. To, uh, sorry about that. But uh, Dr. Ishi, let me slip in a quick question. You know, Japan imports nearly sixty percent of its nutritional needs, and I was keen to know: can we uh, do we need to make about major changes to manage the uh, supply chain part of it? The yeah, system. absolutely. Yeah, I just want to also that, that put a, a global globalization uh, aspect in this and a very exciting conversation uh, because Japan imported uh, the 60% of the food and when we measure that the environmental impact of those external uh, the aspect, that uh, it, it revealed a very striking fact that we are quite okay internal domestic uh, production side on the biodiversity, land and water. But when we introduce this, this spillover impacts through the trade and the, the importation, that the, our major, our score completely changed. And we realized that we destroy a lot of natural capital throughout, through this and the importation. And that we are waking up with this fact and there is a growing interest of the consumers and the retailers, the supermarket, the trading companies, how we can actually clean up uh, to, to make our value chain much more sustainable. So that's why I emphasize in my opening that it's exceedingly important to visualize and uh, to, to make this environmental cost the value of natural capital visualize it and then and, 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 uh, pass it uh, from production to consumption so that that we are able to provide those information to consumers. Somebody mentioned that we need to actually employ the consumer's power, and that, that, but for consumers to act on, that, that they, they need the information. That that's very, very important. I was just listening to Sunny's that, that uh, uh, this a sustainability platform that I hope that can also reach to the, the consumer end of the, the beyond the borders.
us so that we can be a part of this and uh, this challenge. And I'm a little worried about uh, um, this COVID-19 somehow put that the argument to just to promote con uh, local production and local consumption without really thinking how to make the entire value chain much more sustainable. So <laughs> while I fully understand the importance of this uh, smallholder farmer's sustainability and livelihood, we also want to make sure that uh, the entire value chain, that we will have the uh, right information to be passed so that the entire value chain can be transformed. We need to put not only price on natural capital, but human and societal capital. Back to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think you brought up a very key um, uh, factor, the role of information. And I think perhaps the biggest um, learning that we need to share is that we, it's very important to have conversations and perhaps many more such conversations, not only at the international level, but at national level, at community levels. We need to actively engage the farmers, the traders, people in the businesses, to be able to share best practices, whether it is in the production, in the distribution, or also with consumers, um, you know, there will be some resistance to taking to the new changes that are happening, but we really need to go out and deal with it. So these, the role that conversation plays is very, very important. I'd like to thank all of you once again for taking time out to join me for this panel. And I, I wish you all the best for all the work you're going to be doing. Thanks again.